long. Um, but we're going to jump pretty quickly into the exercise tonight, so I'm going to do a quick overview, and then we'll, we'll jump right into what that exercise is. So uh, with this, at this committee meeting, this is, uh, we started meeting back in October, and here's just generally what we've covered to date as a quick refresher. Uh, we've gone over the long-range facilities plan. Uh, we've covered the plan of doing a multi-decade, multi-billion dollar capital improvement program. Uh, and we've also talked about previous bonds and what their criteria has been, what they have included in their process. Uh, we've also talked about what our educational and facility needs are. We've had presentations on the facility condition assessment, the educational suitability assessment, uh, and we've talked quite a bit about what the staff priorities are as far as scopes of work. Uh, we've also looked at some cost data. We've looked at uh, ranges of what total need might be. Uh, we've looked at some sample bond scenarios. We've had some information and presentations about the conceptual master plans, and you actually have more data in your packets tonight uh, on those items as well. And so today we're going to talk about staff options. Uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months, we're going to get community input, and that's all headed to what we're trying to do is have an informed decision about what this bond package is. Real quick, um, actually, uh, I think this is something that Rita brought up, uh, so it'll be good to go over with her when she has an opportunity here oh, next week. Excuse me, just a second. Um, Karen, do we have somebody on the phone? Hi, who do we have on the phone? Hmm. Is there anyone out there? Yep, sorry, I was on mute. This okay, is okay, thanks. Just wanted to check. Hi. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, well, Arita, I apologize you cannot see this. Uh, but quickly, uh, just a quick discussion about what the bond framework uh, could look like. Uh, we've talked about the different categories of work that we put the different scopes into, the educational improvements, the physical facility, uh, capacity, and modernizations, and those are all critical work. Uh, and we've also talked about the need to have flexibility. So the ultimate goal here is to be able to have some flexibility within those scopes of work. So what us that that we're hoping to have uh, over this longer term bond so what you have in front of you tonight are five documents uh, that help you with the exercise so I'm going to walk through those very quickly uh, starting at probably what's in the back of the packet you have a document that looks like this it's the FCA overview we had presentations on the FCA uh, we, we thought it might be worthwhile to give like a two-page kind of primer on that with a little more data just to have as a takeaway. We have the larger, I think it's nine or ten pages, uh, educational and physical facility improvement summary. So in all the options, you will see the staff priorities of the scopes of work that we've been talking about for several months. This is a little wordier version where it talks about why those are the priorities, what the needs are, and also gives some options as we go through the exercise that you might be able to do sort of menu options for each. Uh, there's a high school conceptual master plan overview. This is just uh, a very high overview of, of what the three options are for each high school and then shows a budget breakdown for those and a recommended amount uh, for those high schools. And we can talk about what those recommended amounts are uh, and what we might want to change or is included in there and what is not included. We have a staff options overview. This is the, uh, the word version of the staff options, so it just gives you some more context versus just looking at the budgetary numbers. And then the big document is the, the four staff options. So what these options are, you'll see there's four. The primary difference in each of them is the number of high school modernizations. There's option A, which has zero. Uh, B has one, C2, and D3. You will notice that uh, the specific for options B and C, there's not a specific high school uh, identified. There's a budget amount to cover any option that, that might be there, but it doesn't say exactly which one that be. That would be, need to be a discussion and uh, determination as well. Um, but this is the document we're hoping to use to do the to do the exercise tonight. So it has the different scopes of work. It has the estimated overall need um, 
the priorities that align with the educational and physical facility priorities that are in the other document, the overview, are noted there in the black and bold, whereas the blue is the other scopes of work that we think are important scopes of work but um, haven't been specifically called out as priorities. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so under in. Yes, sorry. And, and I should also clarify that every I'm new option. to this process, so. No, no worries. I mean, the acronyms are throwing me. And sure. I, yeah, and there's just a lot. Like, there's there's so much here. Um, so feel free to ask, ask any clarifying questions. Uh, and I should also note that all the options include uh, finishing the 2017 bomb projects in Benson, uh, which is the last of those projects, and the multiple pathways uh, building as well. They are in all of the options. And I did have a question seeing multiple sure. pathways included on all of those. Is it to be assumed that there's um, construction efficiencies with doing the multiple pathways at the same time as the Benson work or not necessarily? Yes, the multiple pathways project is it's uh, underway. It's in design. It is tracking effectively along with the Benson project. It's just called out separately here as two discrete projects. So we'll jump into the, the exercise, uh, and please feel free to ask questions as we go through the exercise. But what we thought we would do is have people pair up, review the four options that are here, and then make changes to them if you deem fit to any one or all of the options. And by changes, we mean budgetary changes. So with the documents you have to support the exercise, if, for example, you wanted to increase the amount on one scope, uh, for example, option C uh, under ADA, it doesn't have any budget in there. So if you wanted to add the budget that aligns with the option uh, that is in option B, you would add $17.1 million, but then you would also reduce that from somewhere else. So that's, that's the crux of the exercise. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then we'll report out uh, after that when, once we went through that. So we thought we'd maybe give... 20, 15 or 20 minutes to go through the exercise and then see where we are uh, at that point in time. Yes, Julia. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. So um, there were some assumptions that were made about, um, let's just say, the either the one or the two, because mm -hmm. that's where you have a lot of play. So there was assumptions made of what to put. So, for example, somebody assumed – that we needed, you know, under the two high school options, um, you know, $4 million for security and um, nothing for ADA. Mm -hmm. Like, what were those assumptions based on? So this is based on... Or, like, who yeah. created the package? So all staff. So I'll just say collectively as a group we worked on this. And actually um, we figured you'd have some specific questions, and so we have these documents here to help you, but we also brought a bunch of people, smart people here, that could help answer questions on specific uh, categories of work. So, But what this is is based upon the option predicated with the number of modernizations, this is staff's best recommendation at this point in time with the information we have. I'm, I'm open to um, suggestions from my colleagues here, but it almost seems like it makes more sense to me to do this exercise in reverse. So starting with the um, different categories and going through, um, you know, the, the narrative here about how many roofs are failing within... 10 years, mm -hmm. what the informa underlying information that led to the staff recommendations and maybe walking through that together and then looking at the staff recommendations. Okay. Does that make sense, seem to make sense to people? I, I had questions similar to that. I mean, the estimated need is always, you know, the f facilities is always greater than what you have to spend sure. on. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the assumptions going into, like, You've got all this need. How was it determined? Mm -hmm. and it, it would be helpful to just know the thinking process behind the, sure. the numbers it, in, the, in the columns A through D. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And I think I don't know if people have had an opportunity, so maybe we can take a few minutes. So this largely lays that out. So and, it talks about each one of the categories of work, why, the, the, what that need is, and then what the options are. And I, I think it would be most useful to go through that document and then I see. Um, arrive at – 
what the recommendations were. Because last time we visited this conversation, it was just um, the information was being put forward in each of these areas without necessarily a recommendation. Like, okay, Don, if you don't get the whole enchilada, then what are you recommending as the necessary infrastructure improvements on the technology side? Mm -hmm. And walk us through that. Yeah, I, I, I and, agree. And then, yeah. and then to... <clears throat> Uh, okay, column B has five million for operational projects. Column C has zero. What's that mean on the ground? What's that mean for our students? Um, so we get start to get and, some and of that. And and I and I think the more the more we get that in writing or and or on video, uh, it will serve us well in terms of a public process. And we kind of batted around some ideas for. Uh, make your own bond budget, uh, but do it. But give give people um, that background information that where it kind of you know they can make some sensible choices. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand why where the um, what's the decision making behind some of the trade offs and having not studied the document. Yeah. You know, sped classrooms looks like are fully in, at least in option A. Would be fully funded, and then, but performing in visual arts is, you know, there's no dollars allocated. So I'd be interested in hearing about the trade offs that were made. What was prioritized? Like, was it physical building? Was it energy efficiency? Was it. Yeah, th those are great questions, and all very, very, you know, tough decisions about what those trade offs are. Mm -hmm. So if it makes sense, we can walk through, have individuals come and walk through uh, this document. Um, so we can start at the top, and let's, if I can invite... Let's do that, please. Okay. Don Wolf, <clears throat> would you like to join me? Sure. Okay. And is everybody sitting six feet apart from everyone else? <laughs> Not I'm doing, my, I'm doing my job. So I'm, this is being videoed, right? Because we should review the video to see how many times an hour we touch our face. <clears throat> <laughs> A lot. And I, you know, I recognize that this, you guys took a lot of care in composing the packages and making them balance because within any one category, it's easy for that chief to make recommendations about what's necessary. But then the real hard part that you guys have and then that we have is the balance. Um, so I don't want to, you know, we don't want to pit anyone's needs or area of expertise <laughs> against anyone else's, but I think it's beneficial for us to walk through sure. each category. Just for the record, we're not letting them social, be socially distanced? Yeah. <laughs> we, we have been close enough the last three days that at this point, I, I'm not sure that any social distancing here is going to have any impact. I just wanted to be sensitive. Okay, but, but it wasn't appreciate that. So, so I do want to say we're engaging in some not gallows humor, but uh, sarcastic humor, whatever. We, we, everybody here is taking the virus extremely seriously. Mm -hmm. So, uh. so I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss how, how you want me to proceed. If you want me to, what, what is going to work best for you to understand the, the here on technology improvements, and then what led you to your recommendation, or, um, yeah. And so, yeah, so it looks like you you start off with some. Kind of I, over, I start with some some, some some very overarching mm -hmm. comments that you know and everything then, that we do operationally here is dependent on a healthy technological and then infrastructure. Down and dirty with the line item. Um, so I, I think we can start there. We know one one caveat that I, I don't want to read this to you. I don't want to try and recreate that verbatim. You all are very intelligent. You can read all of this, um, but but I do want to highlight a, a couple pieces. There has been a great deal of neglect over the past number of decades around technology in the Portland Public Schools. When I walked in just a little bit over a year ago, I knew that's what I was walking into. Um, I, I, I wasn't quite aware of how deep and how wide that, that neglect has kind of gone. And in the in the past couple of years, one of the, the other pieces that, that is rising to the top of this is uh, attacks on K-12 and small government agencies is, is rising. So from 2016 to today, 
those in 2016, there was a couple hundred of attacks. We're, we're over 900 self-reported this year alone, this in 2019. So they continue to ramp up. They've doubled in the last, and they continue to do so. So when we talk about cybersecurity, that's that's a big component of, of the things that, that are related here. And there's no way for me to – to get super depth in, in the conversation without making your eyes roll back in your head. So when I do that, please let me know and ask me to come up for some air because there's part of that. There's also the, the understanding that in order to be um, a keystone, a flagship, a, a modern school district, there are certain things that need to be equitably accessed in every one of our classrooms and every one of our schools. So that is a large component of this as well when we talk about Infrastructure is one of the big buckets, but classroom modernization. We're, we've done a spectacular job on modernizing some of our high schools, and we've started down that path, but there's a whole slew of our schools that, that don't have the basic elements of a 21st century classroom, a projector, a, a computer in every classroom, voice amplification, those wireless access throughout the building. Um, with, with The major, majority of our buildings don't have those. So that's that's a major component of this. Um, and the, the other pieces are, are talking about some of those operational projects, some of those things that we need to do to, to make it better. So when we talk about having digitized records, not having a warehouse full of, of records that, that should be digitized so we can easily access them, that's when, when we get into the operational components. And additionally, there's another big bucket of money that's that's called professional services. We don't have the staff on if, – if we've got a big bucket of money, we're still going to have to go out and hire people temporarily to help us implement these things to get to a point where we can negotiate over the next eight years what a general fund allocation looks like to help support and maintain those in an ongoing effort. So that's the overall piece here. Um, without a doubt, you will notice when you go through my numbers through option A, B, C, and D, the infrastructure components don't change because we, we can't not do any of those upgrades. We can't not address our switching hardware that is 10 years old, our wireless access points that we do have that are over 10 years old that are a security concern, um, the, the, the connectivity pieces that we need, a phone system that is going to go out of support relatively soon, which is our number one component for life safety. Director Bailey? It, it's 62 million, 62 million, 67 million, is that a typo? No, that is not a typo. If you notice that um, what I did, one of those big components and is, is security, and so cybersecurity. And so that, that $5 million, rather than that, that lived in the first two efforts of operational, but again, when I built this, I didn't realize we were going to build for, for three different exercises. And when I looked at things, okay, what can we get rid of, what can we not, is that cybersecurity element is, is critical for the health and well-being of all of us here. So I, I moved that out of operational projects into infrastructure. I probably should have started there, but we had seen some of those numbers, so that's how I manipulated it. So that's why that one jumps up, because I don't think it's one we can ignore. So, I, so you just said fairly plainly that um, – the bare minimum for technology infrastructure is 65 million. 67. 62, 67, right, right, right. 67, call it. Mm -hmm. and but that, 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 that doesn't get us to any device refresh. That doesn't give us any of our classroom modernization, any of the enhancements that all of our students should expect to see when they walk into a classroom. So... And, and that is, when we did that, the big, the big drop-offs that you will see in the classroom modernization is mostly on do we implement a one-to-one -one program, 6 through 12? Do we back down from them? What is the type of device we're, we're looking at in our first flight of looking at our 6 through 12th graders if we're going to go one-to-one? There is specialized when we talk about all the CTE efforts. We want to make sure we can support that in a take-home type of environment. So we're, we've got a Windows laptop when we go to Phase 2. That moves down to a Chromebook, and we, we start looking at smaller numbers of devices that we move into K-5. And one of the many benefits of that would be if we ever ended up in the absolutely unforeseeable and odd circumstance of having to go to online learning. Mm -hmm. Many of our students would already have devices. Um, so, yes. So 
Go ahead. I was wondering um, the same thing, how much of this budget is you know, good to have versus it's a little bit of forward thinking and resiliency planning for Well, it, you will notice it, it, when you get into the breakdown of the, uh, of the spreadsheets that I put together, I'm not sure if they're in your packet or not, there is a refresh cycle. So we start out and in the middle of the bond, we refresh those devices. Um, because this is an eight-year one-time lump sum of money and a Chromebook or a Windows device of this quality is about a four-year device before they need to be changed out and refreshed. So we built in a refresh cycle in this bond, assuming, hoping that at the end of this eight-year cycle we would be rolling into another another bond cycle where we would refresh at that point. To director to pass this point on operational resiliency beyond student hardware, can you talk about the enterprise systems that these proposed resources would enable the district to maintain operations continuity? Yes, there's there's aspects of that in, in the infrastructure pieces when we talk about refreshing our data systems or where we move them. Our phone system, we, we've absolutely got to replace, and that's a key component of our infrastructure. We will be building in um, right now with our E-rate and that sort of thing. We're building resiliency for our bandwidth and how our networking is consumed, but we also have to build that same sort of resiliency into the switching fabric that we put out. So when we talk about the infrastructure there that, that is dual redundant power supply and be able to to go in both paths that we're building into our fiber infrastructure, that is a key component. Make What's that? And, and uh, yes, and, and getting to our enterprise software, our ERP. Well, I was just going to say, so that sixty-two million does not include, include the that. ERP. It does not. So nothing for finance, nothing for human resources. No, that's a separate line item altogether. So and what, go ahead. Just to say, what's the division between on some of these between the sort of the hardware, the devices, and professional services? I'm not sure. I'm following your question. What's the division? So these all don't get installed. Um, just on day one. <laughs> well, and they like there's some installation of them, or is that going to be paid with non-bond bond related funds? No, that's I the professional. The professional services are to to help us roll these out, help to, to help us make the changes. It's going to require dedicating. If if just for example, if we look at the classroom modernization, there's going to be a, a number of things that we're going to have to do, and so we're going to have to hire a dedicated program manager for a, a temporary period of time, much like a project manager in our modernization efforts, that will oversee that, that will have to deal with all of the aspects of what does it look like in the classroom. We're going to have to define locations in the buildings, what a dedicated setup looks like, where the projector goes, how that's pointed. It's right. those pieces. So what I'm, what I'm trying to figure so out here is, is where what um, is, do you have it divided out by, Here, here's the the infrastructure between and those three big buckets know, and the like professional we, we services? spend in my professional life a lot, a lot of money on the sort of like tech infrastructure people mm -hmm. um, to build it out. And so I'm just curious what is the percentage of or just roughly of between the actual hardware that you're buying or was is implementation device? services the professional services? Yes. Okay, okay so but I'm not seeing separate line item. Where is that? That's 22, 16, or 13. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about the, it's the seventh one. Oh, implementation services, okay. got it. So is that, I'm sorry, just to continue on that. No, yeah, that's. If, depending on each of these packages, it's scaled to um, the size of the project. So actually, you don't get that much project savings by doing less. We don't. You have a, a basic infrastructure of people that you need to to, to yeah. roll this out. Okay. Yes, we absolutely Great, do. Thanks. Is it at forty-four percent of the total cost? I'm trying to read. So the technology implementation services includes the people part of the tech project managers. Yes, implementation. The people that will will be installing the switches for us. The people that will be helping us roll out a phone system. The people that will be configuring the switches, pulling the new fiber inside our buildings that needs mm -hmm. to happen, all of those pieces. We, we will have to rely on outside resources to do that mm -hmm. just because our staff is not equipped to do that. Right. It's specialized. Okay. So the first line item, CR modernization, classroom modernization, yes. three options. Uh, I assume it's more classrooms, less classrooms. No. No, I, I did not. I, I chose to do it a different way. It's it's okay. number of devices. For, uh, excuse me, 
Um, we, we pulled out in, in the first blush is, is looking at how we created some savings there was um, pulling out the number of wireless access points was one of the options that we pulled. So, so we wouldn't have ubiquitous wireless coverage in every building <coughs> the way we would like to have it, but we will make sure that we have the majority of it. So, again, it's going down main hallways instead of putting a wireless access point in every classroom. So that was one of the trade-offs. Um, <coughs> and then how we refresh that. The the third option. So it's pretty good coverage as opposed to. As, as to opposed to knowing that you're not going to have a failure wherever you're at in the building. Um, so you're going to walk into places where there's going to be dead spots um, if, if we go that route. That was, that was the largest cost savings between oh. option A and option B. The, the third option when we drop down is one of those pieces is having, making sure we have dedicated compute in every classroom or every learning space that we walk into. One of the problems we see is subs walk into a classroom and they can't take attendance because the laptop or the Chromebook has gone home with the teacher. Or you go into a classroom to, to do an ad hoc learning experience and you don't have dedicated compute. So the first two options have that dedicated desktop computer that sits there. The third option, we've just pulled that out and say we're going to have to rely on um, fewer numbers, use the teacher, and then have some checkout for subs that, that we put in there. Okay. In terms of uh, the other things you mentioned, like projectors, uh, are those how many? Yeah. We would still include a projector in every option. The third option, we drop down the, the quality of projector. So the lifespan of a projector would be shorter and it would be run on bold hardware as opposed to what our current standard is now, which is a laser projector because they last so much longer. So, I mean, we, we've, we've got this value of thinking long term mm -hmm. and this would be a, you know, pay me now, pay me later. We'd be paying more long term. It would be one of those, it would be a trade off that looks like that, potentially. Okay, but, but each three of them would have up to some standard. Yes. Every classroom in yes. the district. Okay. Yep. And our target is actually not just every every learning space. So Sorry, including yeah. libraries, including gymnasiums, including those places where that is routinely used. Good. That's really. I mean, I wouldn't have known that looking at the numbers. So that's very helpful. What are what are uh, what's the operational projects line? The operational projects lines, the, the two big operational projects include in there would be the digitization of all of our paper records right now so we can get into a complete paperless workflow for a lot of that. All of our students' records are there currently. We've got a process where we're going to get our charters into that over, over the summer. Um, that will be our last ones for our students, but getting all of our human resources, all of our personnel, all of our people documents, and some of our IEPs that are still sitting out there in paper docs. That's the biggest expense. The other, the other part is um, visualization efforts around our data. Um, so we need to, to find some ways to, to up our game on providing dashboards. And so we'd be working in conjunction with Dr. Brown's department and Russ in, in providing some of that internal infrastructure to make that available. But um, so I'm confused because the extra five million that showed up from 62 to 67 is dedicated for cybersecurity projects. And was that in operational projects? It, it was in my in my first blush when I first built this out. I, I put that in there as an operational project. Okay. Um, so should that as, as opposed to I should have built it if. Should that be 67 all the way across? It should be. Okay. And, and we yeah, could yeah, pull yeah. that out of Okay. and just make that part of the infrastructure. Um, and then the, so if we have 6.3 or 5 million and the other yeah. options, that has to do with the visualization, yes. the digitization. Gotcha. Does anybody have any other questions on the technology piece? Uh, yeah. Uh, could I? This is Rita on the phone. Can I um, interject something? Of course. Um, Going back to uh, what I think I heard that, um, and I think it was for the classroom modernization, that the, um, the lower number includes um, using technology that would have a higher cost over the lifetime of the devices. Um, 
so the difference between, you know, upfront costs versus longer term. And that strikes me as a sig- potentially significant thing that we ought to, that the board ought to take into consideration. So if you could um, kind of spell that out whenever that sort of thing is in play, I think that would be helpful for us to, because, I mean, a value that I have is that we should, whenever possible, be looking for solutions that are, um, over the long haul, going to be more efficient and effective, including cheaper. So. Thank you, Rita. I was curious about the um, also the device refresh. If there was a, pro- I don't know if there's a product available that's more uh, more dollars up front, but lasts longer. Because for, I mean, I'm anomaly. I keep my Macs for like eight years or something. Mm-hmm. So. And it's there's there's a lot wrapped up into a device refresh. Um, what that looks like uh, in terms of how you manage and how you maintain them and how you support them on the back end with with our folks as well. So that is part of it. Um, when we look at a Windows device as as opposed to an Apple device, I'm basing that decision based on what we're seeing running in our CTE classrooms. That's why we were looking at providing not just a Chromebook to those to those teachers, but and almost exclusively with a few exceptions, um, like in digital media classrooms, they, they, they will use Macs, but Photoshop and the Adobe Suite will run on a Mac or, or on Windows devices, so we went with a Windows device there as, as, our, our, as our, our first blush um, because we've got more greater flexibility, but those other pieces are, are there. With student devices, that's a lot of wear and tear. That's a lot of, and still we're, at, at best, we're still at an $800 device, not a $1,200 device. If, if we look at that, that we're, we know we're not going to get through all eight years on one device with our students being passed around. So where is your trade-off? So I tried to find some middle ground where it was a reasonably palatable number that we could refresh at and also provide the functionality that our students need and deserve. Any other questions on technology? So, yeah, just the device refresh options would, you know, I don't want to make an assumption about what those different options mean. I, I set so. them at, at, at a four-year device refresh option just because it's an eight-year bond. That's a really nice number <laughs> um, to start here and then go four years. And the reality is we won't get those all rolled out in the first year. There's just That's a lot of work to do. So that buys us a little bit of time because that probably means we're buying the second refresh in the seventh year, possibly, the sixth year in some cases, or the fifth year in, in most of the cases. So that, that rolls us into the next bond when we're starting to look at what our next device, where, where the next pot of money comes from for our next device refresh. But seven, 70 million versus 40 million, what's? From the top end to the bottom end. A, again, going moving from a Windows device to a Chrome device, that cuts that cost in half, and then lowering the numbers. So we stayed at one to one in option two. In, in grade 6, 12, but at, at a Chromebook. But we, we cut down the numbers. Instead of a 2 to 1 ratio, we're looking at a 3 or 4 to 1 ratio in our elementary schools. Option 3 takes that way, way down. And it moves us not to a 1 to 1 in grade 6, 12, but more at a sufficiency model. And is this taking to, into account? I know you probably, it's hard to even have an inventory of what we have out there now because it's such a patchwork. But does this take into account what we have now, or is it just assuming that? It is overlaying numbers currently what we have now. I know, like right now, we I know we have 21,000 Chromebooks that are set to expire from support from Google this year. Um, we have 37,000 Chromebooks out there in the wild right now. We have overall about 50,000 devices out there running around. So wow. these, yeah, there's, there's a lot out there. Theoretically, that's one-to-one. Theoretically, that's <laughs> one-to-one. Some of those Chromebooks are s- the original Chromebooks that San- <laughs> so, uh, were, were first put out, so yeah. that Samsung first released. So they're, they're pushing the seven, eight-year mark at this particular point in time. They, they continue to function, but they're not receiving <clears> updates, which is problematic on a number of reason levels. So can we get some concrete examples of this means that in the classroom with this option, you can do this that you couldn't with this option and couldn't with that option. We, that we can certainly put sense? some ratios together for yeah. you. I can bring that back and 
So, so yeah, what the, the ratio translates into in my fourth grade classroom, if we had put this much money in, that means I'd have these devices. Mm -hmm. That means I could do this with my students here. If I want to do kind of the same lesson, it means this, sure. and here it means uh, we're all in an abacus, you know. <laughs> Um, right. but, I prefer but, a slide rule, but yes, absolutely, we can we can work to provide that for you. You're really dating yourself now, <laughs> um, but that I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything further on technology? Um, our next piece is curriculum. I'm guessing that's why Sarah Davis is here. Curriculum is a little easier, I think, because the options are just more or less of the same. That is correct. Rather than. Or I guess the nuance would be um, option B, we actually look at um, eliminating content areas, and then option C, we look at reducing slightly across all of the content areas. So having, so A, A gets us um, to a point where, where we have um, up-to-date and standards-aligned instructional materials uh, across all of the content areas. Um, and then option B prioritizes um, in alignment with the board goals. Um, and then option C kind of looks at if, if we didn't fully get everything, but we at least had something across all areas. I forgot to say thank you, Don. <laughs> so I'm sorry. So option B, um, the $32 million gets you, you said aligned against our goals. What specifically does – I know what our goals are, but and so crosswalk with, to the curriculum for me. So um, within the board goals, mathematics and language arts um, are – our higher priorities, and so if you'll see in option B, so mathematics and language arts adoption materials are still there, but social studies and world languages fall out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was just kind of like in, in terms of, um, you know, and then with PE staying, PE and arts um, also is part of the well-rounded education um, and aligning with um, state um, ordinances, uh, you know, and so, so that's it, it. We didn't just kind of choose and pick, we really looked at, like, if, if we're going to do option B where we do some content areas and not others, then aligning that with both board goals and, and state priorities. But it would be K-12 across the district? Yes. So it wouldn't be, like, we're going to do this cluster? No. Or, okay. And yeah. so we wouldn't have a Division 22 report, again, that we don't – have our curriculum updated curriculum materials or curriculum materials to standards like this would do it o option a would option a would do okay. it yeah yep okay so b is prioritized and c and d are uh, coming out of the general fund as opposed to the, the bond yeah or just kind of cutting cutting across the board so you know like so you know yeah. certain certain additional materials would not not be gotten. And, and, and by all the given me So like. it sounds like it C is you wouldn't have complete adoptions in anything. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there, I mean, there's always some general fund money going towards this stuff that it would be. Correct. And so um, and a, a big place that the general fund funding would be going would be in the professional development and the, the teacher support because this yeah. funding is buying the materials. Um, and so the, the general fund complement would be for the professional development. Any questions on uh, our curriculum options? I think that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, special education. For special ed, I want to invite John Lyons, who has been working with the special ed department. You, you did have an elegant plan for this meeting, but... As far as I'm concerned, I think this is working well. <laughs> Whatever the need is, we're happy to accommodate this. Is. Hi. So I should preface this with I am not an educator. Uh, I'm an architect, but I've been working with the special education group for about uh, five or six months to figure out what their needs are. So just as a refresher, the um, facility condition assessment identified special education <coughs> as one of our most uh, in need or underserved by our buildings. Uh, so uh, almost immediately after getting those results, I started working with Mary Mertz and her group to identify how we could improve this, uh, specifically with our facilities. Um, so through a set of questionnaires and interviews, um, we identified acoustic, visual, uh, and, and um, adaptive furniture configurations as the highest um, uh, and, and 
um, most impactful need for these classrooms. So what this uh, uh, $22 million amount is, is you take a, a furniture template, and what this furniture template does and where it was derived from was uh, one of our most recent modernization classrooms. Take that as our base. So this gives us flexible classroom arrangements. We fold in uh, acoustic mitigation built in. We fold in uh, dimmable LEDs, and, and we fold in um, built-in casework. So, uh, uh, so that, that's casework that's actually um, constructed into the wall. Uh, so some carpentry that's going to be necessary. Yeah. Then we, we multiply that. Uh, we get that cost. We multiply that across our uh, self-contained special education classrooms. We currently have 82. Uh, and and uh, that's um, intensive skills, uh, social, emotional, and communication behavior classrooms. Um, so that's that high number. Uh, the the uh, 13 million is is those same set of improvements, but across less of those those classrooms. So we have 82. We would just do less. <laughs> okay. Welcome. No. I'll just keep so you guys can spread out. <laughs> so, uh, Director Scott, basically what we're doing is we are walking with staff through this document. Um, they put together scenarios which are combinations of recommendations from the different areas, but first we wanted to walk through each area. So Don Wolf went through the um, recommendations and scenarios on technology. Sarah Davis just walked through on curriculum. And now we are on the special education um, section. And my apologies to the board and staff for Welcome. being so late. It was a crazy day for, for all governments <laughs> and businesses. It's a crazy day. Yeah. Great. So just to orient you, um, option B would be the same set of improvements. So we would be doing interventions into individual classrooms with acoustics, lighting, and built-in casework, but we would just do fewer classrooms. Uh, and then option C, uh, the $4.5 million amount, that's just the furniture. So we're just talking about furnitures, fixtures, and equipment for that option. And again, that number is derived from one of our most recently completed modernizations. We took the, the equipment from that room. Uh, the, the amount was something like $16,000 just for the stuff. Uh, and then we're, we're taking that amount and multiplying it across our current SPED uh, classroom. So, so, so do, we how, have, do we have a different spreadsheet version? Yeah, I was looking for that as well. Because I've got $22.3 in A and yep. zero for the other three. Right, so I'm, I'm referring to this document, the oh. options outlined there. So. And um, my question would be, um, gotcha. like okay. option B, how would we make that determination between that's a, classrooms? That's a great question. So um, the educational suitability component of the FCA um, ranked individual classrooms. So we have that, that data array. We, I assume, um, start at the bottom and, and work our way up. So is that roughly 40 classrooms? Roughly 40 classrooms. That's about right, yeah. And can you can you yeah. talk about how they were prioritized? Which you were, said they'd start at the bottom and work up. So um, to, I mean, yeah. how would we? How how was that? What determination? How was determined which of Great those question. classrooms yeah. would be prioritized? Great question. So the the um, educational suitability began with the the items that were outlined in our ed spec. Uh, and each classroom in the district was evaluated against those standards uh, and, and basically given a score uh, on those standards. So uh, some obviously did better than others. So, yeah. Other questions on special ed? No, thanks. That's very clear. Great. Before I let John go, I'll ask him to briefly talk about <laughs> briefly the other scopes of work and just some of the other work, uh, including around performing in visual arts, if you would. Yeah. Please. Please. So, if you, if you had zero and these had two columns, even though in this document there's 
step down increments. The recommendation from staff is if you go to to B, it's kind of doing it. I just want to make sure. Even though that sure. there was a step down option. So, so this would be more um, good to have versus critical. I don't want to say <coughs> Well. Well, it's kind of all or nothing, too. Well, it, it, it is, and it also isn't. I'll, I'll point you to on the options, the, the, this document, um, there's a bunch of blue text. And so we went pretty in-depth into what staff has been uh, identifying as what we believe are the priority scopes of work. And so we went in-depth in there and gave options there. But there's lots of other scopes of work that, uh, are important too in these categories. So where you see the blue and the bold, the additional amount available for remaining or other projects, those are amounts that would be intended in that option to be spent on uh, projects within that scope. For example, if you look at option B, there's $10 million under the educational improvements. So the idea is there would be an additional approximately $10 million to spend on on some of that other work, exactly what that is, we're just not at that level of detail yet. But it's our catch-all. It's a bit. It's a bit of a catch-all. So I think when you see zeros, don't always think zero. Just think not significant amounts. And again, we do have that 10% program contingency, which is over 100 million dollars. That would also be spent on different scopes of work as as we prioritized over time. But in the past, has that contingency been pretty much eaten up? It was on the paper already. Uh, oh, it has gone – it's, it's part of a risk management tool. So yeah. we've got a long-term bond. We've got certainly some significant projects with, it, with a specified scope of work, so we want to be able to complete that scope of work. Uh, as we move through the, the modernizations, for example, we move through those, and if those funds are not needed, then the risk goes down, and then that is available – those those contingency funds are available for other projects. So none of the other – uh, bonds have had this amount of program contingency. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Hundred. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking back to 2012. We had what a 10 million reserve, and then there was some contingency, and then of course we did the high schools. We both expanded the capacity from 15 to 17, and then we uh, also changed the formula for, I think it was square foot per student as well, and that. That kind of eight. Correct. After the 2012 bond passed, the high schools increased collectively by about 150,000 square feet. Yeah. So that's what most of those funds went to. And just, go ahead. Just to reiterate, though, what you just said, there is um, there's project contingency built in to each of the estimates for, Correct. say, like the high schools. This yes. is program contingency built in overall. Correct. And that has not been something that was done in previous bonds. Well, not to this amount. Not a 10%. Well, right. Not a 10%. Much smaller. I mean, there has been program contingency built in, but what you're describing is maybe we should have a different word for it because it's not a contingency in the traditional sense in terms of, like, costs being there to cushion cost overruns. I mean – Really, you're saying it's more there uh, as a reserve for undesignated needs. I think it's both. Um, initially, um, you're going to want to spend that slowly, allocate it slowly yeah. to make sure that when you uh, projects that have higher risk, you get through those risk hurdles. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, if you do need funds, if you have a project, a specific high school, and something unexpected happens and that costs $10 million, you have that available, even if it's above the, the project contingency. And you even have though it available. theoretically we believe that we have appropriate contingency tucked in other places for potential overruns, this is a, in addition to that. This is an addition. and Not a perfect example, but could be the multiple pathways building, which wasn't a part of the original scope of work. Was added later, there wasn't program contingency for it. This would be something akin to that. You could say, oh, we ha actually have those funds available to add that scope of work. This is, a, this is one of the things we're doing to sort of ensure that as we go forward in the 2020 bond, we can, we can cover the things that, that we're, we're saying we, Correct. we plan to. Yeah. Yes. No, it, it's a good improvement. And so I actually think, I think both of this is, it is there mm -hmm. for cost overruns, mm -hmm. unexpected things, new things that come in. But as you mentioned, as we go through the bond and narrow it down, we'll be able to spend it for other things. I think it's important for the board not to view it, though, as money that could be allocated to these other things. 
until we're farther into right. actual yeah, bond yeah. implementation. Correct. So yeah. think of the, the blue numbers, if you will, as more of those those could be allocated fairly quickly to these other scopes of work as as needs are identified, right. uh, whereas the program contingency is something that you just got to set aside for a while. Yeah. Got it. Your fingers. That's right. And it's like you're on the bench. All and you might not get to play in the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But you never know. I'm, I'm trying to help Julie understand with a sports analogy. <laughs> okay, real quick, if you would. Yeah. Uh, so just moving on to, F, uh, excuse me, PE and visual and performing arts. Um, so PE, just to remind you, was another program area that we found to be underserved by our facilities. There are currently nine schools in the district without dedicated gyms. So, so uh, g- uh, gym class, gym programming is happening in uh, gymnasium, cafeteria type situations. Uh, um, so the, the avenue forward that we'd like to pursue or that we discussed with academic leadership is, is first option would be um, building out new gym space for these schools. Uh, and then the second option would be pursuing covered play structures on site uh, to alleviate some of the pressure that they're having, the programmatic pressure that they're having within the building, um, just so kids could go outside year-round, potentially. So is that like Riki that has uh, the multi-purpose gym, cafeteria? That's exactly right. Room? That's exactly right. I think right. Chapman's in the and same there's, there's nine of those? There are nine, correct, yeah. yeah. So... It, it, is that actually feasible on every site to in terms of build a, build site a gym? capacity? Um, we'd need to look into that. Okay, so if I were to guess, I would say theoretical. No. We recognize Maybe. this is an issue. That's and, correct. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's um, why we've been exploring the need for covered play structures. There are currently 46 sites in the district that don't have um, play structures or outdoor covered play structures right now. Um, staff is currently developing um, a, a prototype structure uh, that, that we would be able to get through um, design and engineering and permitting really, really quickly uh, so we could um, implement these um, uh, one, as soon as we get the funds. So uh, The other program that I've been interfacing with was visual and performing arts. Um, this group didn't want to pursue the, the avenue that this Fed group pursued, um, which is looking at components within classrooms. Uh, what we found with SPED is that, or excuse me, um, visual arts, um, was that there were 18, um, 18 visual arts programs throughout the district that didn't have dedicated visual arts spaces. So these classes are happening art on a cart. Uh, they're happening in spaces, uh, science classrooms, without um, tack board, without sinks in many cases. Um, so the, the numbers that you'll see in your options there reflect new construction. We're building new art space. New construction, not just modification. Correct. So. Wait, so let's make sure we're under new construction. We'll be expanding the footprint of our schools. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank cool. you, John. Yeah. Uh, and if there are any other questions, uh, we'll move on to the physical facility improvements. So we'll start with Ruth. This is where it gets really real. This is it does, and um, we have a few people here who could talk to this. Nothing. I'll maybe ask Patrick to come down. Okay, good. Um, and I'll start talking, but Patrick, you can. I guess by that I the mean details. there are no small money options. There are no small money, op- uh, small money options here. Uh, roof and the roof mechanical systems. Um, are certainly two of our most critical needs. Uh, the FCA has provided nice data, um, kind of high-level data. Yes. I'm sorry, just one sec. Rita, we didn't really give you an opportunity to weigh in there before we move on. Did you have anything? No, that's okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Thanks. No problem. Um, the roofs, um, the FCA gave us some nice high-level data uh, assessments on our roofs and on our mechanical system as well. And roofs are high need and, and have been a high need in the district for a number of years. And uh, past bonds have done a great job of, of tackling a lot of them, but we still have quite a few uh, that are in pretty poor shape. So looking over the FCA data, we estimate that um, about 30 roofs would need to be replaced over the life of the bond. The FCA uh, itself, if I'm looking here quickly at the options, 
um, identifies approximately 30 that would likely require a full replacement in 10 years, um, but 25 of those within the next three to four years. So there is a, a critical acute need in, in our roofs, and of course, roofs are very important for protecting the overall system um, and the health of the buildings as well. So we gave two options here. The first option, that $182 million, is the estimate for addressing approximately 30 roofs over the course of the bond. Uh, some systems, roof systems, will perform better. Some will perform worse. So it's unlikely we would hit exactly 30. It'd probably be more that we would do somewhere in the ballpark of 20 to 25 replacements and then target improvements at other roofs where they need a specific component or uh, a piece of the roof uh, replaced but not the entire thing. So it's not that holistic where we know exactly what those roofs would be, but we have a good idea. Do we have reason to believe that we could actually contract that work and get that much roof work done? We do. We estimate that. I mean, that would be three to four roofs a year. We're doing roughly yeah. three to four roofs right now, which is which is a challenge. Um, and certainly with the market, uh, we don't get as much competition as we would like. But um, considering what the need is and what we've been able to do in recent years, we think that we could complete that. I think that market's about ready to change. <laughs> it could change dramatically, yes. Oh, with and that's like a symptom of the underneath. Yeah. Patrick, anything to add on roofs? Uh, I think you explained it pretty well. I, I want to emphasize the past bond work for the roofs has really helped facilities out and the number of roof requests that we've received over the years to, to address roof leaks and the sort has really improved. I think we need to continue that, but uh, it's been really good so far. How many roofs have already been completed out of all of our buildings, or the school buildings? Do you have? I'm going to turn and see. 26. 26? 26? 26 through the bond. Does that include the ones in 2009? Yes. Okay. 26. Okay. I'll move on. Thank you, voters. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or, Rita, do you have any questions? be a correct calculation. If you Sorry, get there's a time lag. I have to find the mute button. Um, it, I, I didn't hear the number of roofs. Did you say that? How many have we it already was, replaced? It was 26. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yes. So just want to check just a general assumption. So if you get 30 roofs for $182 million, over time... You could over a thir say if you had more eight-year bonds over th 25 years, you could do all. You would be in a cycle of getting all the roofs done. Would that be kind of a sustainable cycle? I think I understand your question, and I think the answer is yes. With you know roughly 100 buildings, say roofs last. You know, 25 years, you're doing roughly four roofs a year. We've done a lot of them over the last 10 years, so that's what we're seeing the FCA. We have a little say. bit of a bubble. Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, because I was just thinking of like the just on, if you think about like an ongoing uh, capital plan, just having the 180 millions are you doing these cycles and it's then you're never like, hey, we're trying to catch up again or. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the sequence of three to four, you're being able to do that is when you got 100 roofs, that's about the right number. Okay, uh, moving on to the mechanical systems. Uh, mechanical systems are a challenge to uh, determine exactly when they are not performing well, what that is, being able to estimate what that fix is and, and complete that fix. And so I'll just preface with any large mechanical system that we would go after, you know, we would have a mechanical engineering firm come in assess, identify exactly what needed to be done. And the text here talks a little bit about that. That said, our, our mechanical systems uh, are, are one of our, if not our number one biggest facility need. We've had over 6,000 work orders related to mechanical systems just last year. Um, the SCA here notes uh, 180, or excuse me, 1,800 deficiencies in the top three categories in over 80 sites. So that's almost every site is having some sort of fairly significant uh, mechanical uh, issue. 
the way that we estimated these options is, is very high level, and that's why we put this detail in here. I want to be clear that we don't have a lot of specificity about our systems, about what is causing the performance to be so low and how we would best fix that. Oftentimes with mechanical systems, because their components are dependent upon each other, you'll go in to address one, and you'll bring that system up, and, and that component will cause another one to fail. So they are very tricky. Um, but the first option at the uh, 200 million the FCA identifies, um, I have it in here, I'm going to forget my notes. I believe it's 50 sites that right now have either critical or potentially critical, so failing in the next anticipated one to two years uh, of over a million dollars of just hard cost repair fixes. So that is not the total cost. That is just the hard cost, uh, and that is not even the complete total of what that fix might be. So we took that number to say we've got 50 sites that over the course of this bond will most likely need to have some sort of significant repairs done to them, maybe a, com a complete replacement of the mechanical system, uh, which can trigger all sorts of other things like the electrical system and things as well, uh, or many of them will, will be targeted. We'll need to go after the controls or we'll need to go after something else. So we estimate a full system based upon, I think, a, a uh, lower version of the Tubman project. We took those costs and said uh, without all the additional work that was done at the Tubman uh, site, about $10 million. So if we think that we could get as many as five significant projects done a year, we estimated that of those of those systems that need significant work, let's say they need half of it done. Just uh, Some will need more than half, some will need less, so $5 million a year. That's how we came up with uh, doing uh, the $200 million number. So it's a very high-level number. And so exactly what we would need, um, we'd be going into these systems. We know that they're performing very, very poorly. Get teams out there to identify what the fix would be, design that, and then complete that work. But that's how we would tackle that. And there, there isn't much detail in here about um, new versus replacement. I mean, don't we have a lot of our boilers are like 100 years old and you're yeah. having to manufacture parts and things like that? Is there an Sometimes, overall, yes. Is there an overall um, goal of trying to replace those or we can still keep just fixing them? I think it, it was up to me on the facility side. We would replace our mechanical systems with brand new systems, high efficiency boilers, new control systems, um, um, the, the whole nine yards, um, and get rid of the boiler with the steam systems because we've had a lot of steam leaks recently, and I think over the past we've just seen that curve go up. Um, that would that would be a great goal, I think, to switch from the steam systems we have currently, the old boilers, to high efficiency boilers and more modern HVAC systems. And that, that's something that there's some state matching. Yes. Yeah. And, and SB 1149 and yeah. Energy Trust funds mm -hmm. would play a big and, part in that. And, and that gives us a saving stream as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious in, in, in learning more about the Energy Trust of Oregon um, rebates mm -hmm. and the state, uh, the state, I think it's a tax incentive. <clears throat> If I'm not mistaken, and, and figuring out what the cost benefit of would be replacing the systems with like a high high efficiency heat pump, um, mm -hmm. or some sort of system replacing the controls, so we've got that. I mean, I'd like to get the full picture of what that would cost for our buildings. I think it'd be really valuable um, to look at the effic efficiency, mm -hmm. um, the savings, efficiency savings versus the total cost upfront to uh, modernize those systems. Because yeah, I know it's really hard to go in and piecemeal, find parts and look for leaks, and it, it just seems like it's so much uh, it takes so much time and energy, and we ended up we end up patching hundred year old systems right. rather than replacing with high efficiency things that are going to work, uh, you know, for years. Right. And I know that's more work. Yeah, we can we can get you some. I know some someone. Uh, I know people that do that kind of work though. Yeah. I mean, Energy Trust would be happy to send someone over for free. Yeah, and we work closely with the Energy Do Trust. You? Yeah, yeah and, uh, and Patrick has a project manager that focuses on energy improvements to schools mm -hmm. and works with Energy Trust, yeah. Yep. So vote for that. <laughs> Any other questions on mechanical? 
<clears throat> All right. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, you want to stick around for a Security. Uh, security. Molly Emmons, I don't believe, is here. I think she's still up in the EOC. Otherwise, she would be here tonight. Uh, so I'll hit on security fairly quickly. Uh, what you have for the options are three different scopes of workforce security. Um, the option A, item A, is replacing all the classroom locks in the district at $4 million. Uh, the option B at $20 million is doing additional surveillance cameras throughout the district, and that's estimated on a square footage basis. And then that item C there is our security alarms. A lot of our alarms are out of date and, and need to be updated and replaced, and so that's what that, that option there is. Uh, security has spent quite a bit of time over a number of years, including as the two, 2017 bond security scope of work uh, got prepared. We had a consultant come in, work with our security department to identify what and recommend what our priorities would be as a district. And so the, the first priority was putting in the, the two end system, the buzzer system that we're doing in all the schools right now, but these were other high priority items. So that's why you see those on the list. On the door locks, mm -hmm. are those the key code door locks rather than a key? No, they're, they're just so if there is a situation in a school, anyone can close the door and lock the door and, okay. and shelter in place versus a key. Versus a key. Yeah, needing a key to do it. <clears throat> and then is that um, $20 million for surveillance systems in all schools? Correct. Does that hit all schools? Yes. Any other questions there, security systems? Seismic. Okay. We'll jump into seismic. Um, seismic is uh, also one of the most significant needs in the district. Uh, it's, the seismic scope is not a part of the FCA, but we do have some other seismic assessments, some older work. And so we've, um, we've taken those, those older numbers and estimated them forward to today. And, and the total estimate for bringing all of our sites up to code is over a billion dollars. So we know that this is expensive work. We know it is uh, very dirty and time-consuming work, and often you know, bringing a school up to code can't be completed over a summer. We'd have to look at swing sites if we were going to do just that scope of work. Um, but we did look at a few options that we thought could be achievable through this bond, and I will let Patrick walk through those real quick. One sec. Can I interrupt for one second? Um, so is the current code level three or level four? Current code is level three. So any of our new buildings meet the, the level three. Level four, uh, we talk about quite a bit, is uh, also known as immediate occupancy. So our new high schools that we are designing and constructing right now have a portion of the school, a gathering space that is seismically, uh, structurally up to level four, that immediate occupancy, but the entire building meets the level three. Okay, Patrick. Um, so you'll see uh, three options there. We'll start with the um, $66 million option, which is fully retrofitting up to nine of our smaller schools. Um, and w how we uh, looked at those nine or got to that nine was we chose schools that were um, in line for a roof replacement and as well as are listed on the City of Portland's URM database, Unreinforced Masonry. So if they're on that list and they're scheduled to get a roof replacement out of this bond, then we want to be efficient and target those for a seismic retrofit. Um, that's how we looked at it. So in conjunction with, but this cost is additional to yes. the roof. Yeah. yeah. Was now, there any uh, geographic um, consideration there so that seismic work was done kind of geographically distributed? So there's, well, the URMs, I don't know what's in that database. I've never seen it. I was just curious. But strictly just based. Earthquake, like is yeah. there geographic distribution. We didn't look at that. Maybe the city did, and, and um, but it, we just looked at the URM uh, schools listed on the URM database from the city as well as uh, sites that were scheduled to get a roof replacement. Do you know how many sites are in that URM database? Oh, I, I think it's 20, 
17 to 20, something like that. I could get you an exact number, though. And, and do you get some seismic benefit with the roof replacement yes. themselves without this additional yes. work? Yes. So the roof work that we have estimated also has a seismic component to it, which would be you'd be laying down a plywood diaphragm on the roof mm -hmm. and then tying that diaphragm to the walls so they'd act as, as one if, if a seismic event took place. But so that's at roof level only. So it's only at the roof level. Only then. at roof level. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot my question. Is that is that seismic work included in the roof estimates we just looked at? Yes. Okay. Yep. So one could argue if you want to spread the benefit, you specifically don't want to invest more in those that we're already <coughs> doing something with if the alternative is leaving a lot of schools untouched with regard to seismic reinforcement. Mm -hmm. But you could also say why that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I apologize if I'm, um, or maybe you're about to get into it. If you got more to go through here, um, just was going to yeah. touch on the. I think the other uh, option B has 15 million listed, so that would that would be roughly three sites. That would, yeah. Um, I, so, but everything here is uh, each option here is in conjunction with roof replacements. So that tells me that you guys think it's not a good idea to invest in seismic work in our schools that aren't getting re roof work. Let's, the, the theory is like, let's take care of the ones that we're going in and do them right, as opposed to spreading the benefit more widely. It's, the seismic but, work is very invasive. So... Um, need to keep that in mind. Got if we're going to go into a building, it's you're going to be touching a lot of the building, okay. um, big yeah. impacts. And so, if we're doing roof work already, um, you know, it would it'd be efficient to do it all at once. If you're just going into a building and just strictly looking at doing seismic work, I mean, it's it would be. I mean, that was one consideration we looked at. I don't know if that answered your question, yeah, but. Any questions on the seismic work? ADA. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Yep. And I will invite John Lyons back again. I have a, just a general question. Sure. It's a little bit about the seismic, but also the mechanical systems. So you make some pretty big investments. Does that – I'm trying to see how that interplays with just – Say we make a big investment in a in a building that's fair. Say we put a new mechanical system in, do some sizing upgrades. Does that mean that they kind of move to the moving more to the back of the, the full modernization list? Or I mean, how how does that calculation or that matrix get set up? Because um, you're now going beyond just you know I think some more basic. Improvements. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great question. Uh, in the long range facilities plan, it makes a specific note about you know being prudent about investing in buildings that could be modernized in the near future. And so, we've always looked at, at high schools about that. So we've been, you know, cognizant of when we're going to do a significant improvement in a high school that hasn't been modernized, that that improvement could be taken out in upcoming years. Uh, so I, I don't know if the perfect answer is, you know, that comes into play. That said, certain systems are so poor we have to do it anyway. Wilson got a roof very early on 2012 bond. I think it was in the summer of 2013, right. if I recall. Uh, Cleveland got a roof as well, uh, the, the most of it. So that does come into play. So you got to kind of, of weigh what those options are. And also, um, you know, knowing that a, a future bond is, you know, has to be referred by the board and has to be approved by voters. So it's, it's, it's weighing all those variables. So maybe it's part of a, of, a, of a formula, but more art than science. Yeah, I think it's a, a little bit of both. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Okay. So for barrier removal, the three options we have start with um, district-wide main level accessibility. So that would be removing all barriers uh, from the site 
moving into the first floor, floor of the building. And this option would allow program administrators uh, to uh, move programs around within the building to accommodate a person experiencing a disability. Uh, and and our, our high level estimate for that is about $30 million. Option B that we're looking at um, defines uh, two K-5s, one middle school, and one high school per cluster as barrier free. Uh, and, and one, <coughs> this isn't a caveat, but, but something that's important to consider here is um, um, this is the most affordable option to define those accessible paths through these clusters. So um, optimal geography is not considered here. Uh, similarly, uh, option C uh, is, is identical to option B, but it's only one K-5. So one K-5, one middle school, and one high school per cluster, barrier-free. Uh, and that's $11 million. And I will say this, this includes $3.7 million for um, the, 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 excuse me, the, the high schools that are under consideration for modernization, say that. So. And, and we already um, at least have discussed this um, way of looking at things in terms of accessibility, specifically from the 2012 bond. So, so what is the status quo right now in terms of each cluster accessibility by each of those grade bands? It's... Inconsistent. But comparing cluster, uh, cluster to well, cluster. Well, you know, like when we made decisions in the 2012 bond about which schools would receive elevators mm -hmm. and, um, you know, other um, main level accessibility um, independent projects, um, how much progress did we make, I guess, is what I'm asking. Uh, that's a good question. If Jen Soam's still here, she might be able to come help me answer that a little bit better. The 2012 looked at... Um, making sure there's accessibility to specific programs within schools and within the district. And so all of that work, uh, as it was identified, was completed through the 2012 uh, bond program. This, uh, John is, is working on the ADA transition plan update. And so part of that update is identifying what is what's the, the priorities. So when we, as we phase this work over time, what is it we want to go after first? So uh, what you see in the option C and B is is what appears to be the likely option of how we would go about prioritizing our accessibility improvements as we move to being fully compliant throughout the district. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure if it did. Yeah. So I, I understood your, your question to be how many clusters have, do we have a cluster that has at least two, one, and one? Yeah. I see. I apologize. We currently don't, no. Yeah, okay. Wow. So... I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? The two K-5s, the one middle school and the one high school, are barrier-free by cluster. That's the 66 million or the 17. 17 million. 17. One, one, and one is 11. Yeah. What, and just for curiosity's sake, there's the 107 for the whole enchilada. Um, what what's included in that that's not in the 29.630 million? Right. So the the really complicating factor uh, that, that differentiates that 30 number uh, 30 million uh, option A from the uh, 100 million plus is elevators. Uh, so for a three stop internal elevator, we're looking at about 1.5 million dollars. Yeah. So and we currently have I believe it's 28 multi level schools without elevators. Really so, so option A and B. I mean, so when you say removing barriers from all sites, mm -hmm. does that mean elevators in all multi-story sites? It sounds uh, like it doesn't mean. So. Well, so so option B would include elevators. So stairs in this case would be considered a barrier. Okay. Uh, but but option A. We're just looking at main level accessibility, so no elevators included in option A. But elevators uh, are, is, sorry. Yeah, so, so that was, con, I was a little confused because I heard option A being removing. They're, they're all. apples and oranges, what Indeed. you're doing with option A and option B. 
Okay, so can you run Absolutely, yeah. through that one more? Yeah. What exactly is option A? Option A is just looking at main level accessibility. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. we're just looking at the site, the entrance, and then moving around on the main level. District-wide. And, District and the rest disabled student or staff, then you've got to accommodate them by moving their classroom to the first level. That's exactly right, yeah. So no elevators included in that. Zero elevators in option A. Whereas B would be a limited number of elevators and barrier removal work. Does right. does the does the removing barriers on that first level um, meet the ADA you know requirements? In other words, if there are several classrooms and there's an easy way to get in and out of the building, an accessible way rather, and there are several, you know, gender neutral restrooms that have the turning radius and all that, does that meet the ADA requirements? Is there any requirement that um, second story building in a in a hundred year old building be adapted, or is the first floor, you know, is, does does that meet the requirement? Would it, just let me rephrase your question, see if I understood it correctly. So, would uh, um, improvements, accessibility improvements on a second floor um, qualify as accessible improvements for the building? Is, sorry, no. I didn't understand. No. Would uh, would making the first floor of a building uh, barrier free right. by you know redoing the entrance and exits, um, expanding the bathrooms to meet the requirement, um, adding grab bars, uh, all the accessibility on the first floor, would that meet the ADA requirement? To, would it meet an accessibility requirement for our buildings, or do we need to go above and beyond that to be considered ADA compliant? I think I understand your question, and we would have to go above and beyond it. So if we, if a building was accessible just to the first floor, not to the second or additional floors, it would not be considered fully compliant. Okay. That was my question. Yeah. Thanks. I just want to follow up on that. It would be considered partially compliant, though, right? So, Correct. I mean, yes. this is a tricky area in terms of, I mean, it's a tricky area in terms of the question would be if someone were to challenge it, right? And, and again, there's not a bright line test necessarily um, in terms of, I mean, if we were accommodating, it, it is possible that for a challenge we would succeed. It's possible we would not. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I think maybe the distinction is functionality. Can, can you be accessible at the first floor and still be functional? Arguably, yes. Uh, do you meet a code requirement of being fully accessible? You do not. So that's, I think it's yeah. A I mean, bit I, I was concerned more about you know the user friendliness of the building that we could accommodate um, disabled staff or students um, and visitors, not whether we would be challenged in court. But would would that be meet the requirements for providing you know accessible space for learning? And it sounds like it doesn't. That we would have to the building would have to be uh, barrier free in its entirety in order to meet the. ADA requirements. That's correct. Um, and then if uh, high school is redone, that would reduce um, one of these, was it option B, it would reduce by roughly a million per high school or something? Is that, so, you uh, said three, I think 3.7. Yeah, so option B and C. Uh, if we were to move forward with yeah. our modernizations, then that would that number would go down by three uh, three point seven million dollars. Uh, that's if we did all three high schools. Correct. So a million plus per high school, or just it, it's not high. evenly distributed across yeah, yeah, the high yeah. schools. But yeah, that's the idea. Thanks. Yeah. So we took all our time with, which was super helpful, I think, the way we just walked through that. Um, I think it was necessary. But we took all our time without reviewing the staff recommendations, which last time we met, we said the purpose of our next meeting will be to go over specific recommendations. So um, Director Scott, chair of this committee, it's 6 o'clock, which I know your internal bell goes off. So. Well, yeah, but I was 45 minutes late, so <laughs> we have plenty of time to so. continue. I'm sorry. I, I mean, uh, as far as I'm joke. concerned, we can continue. Very bad. Very bad joke. Um, yeah, I would defer to you in terms of, yeah. Just to, does everybody have time to go through the, the packages, the scenarios, as you put them together to hear the rationale 
uh, behind them. And I think I think this is a completely different conversation than if we had done it before we had the level of detail that we just walked through. So um, I would love to have five more minutes to go through the blue stuff <laughs> uh, for this section of it. I think the the rest of them might kind of have an idea of what they mean, um, but the like fire the fire safety piece. Um, I know we're out, we've been doing sprinklers, but if you could just put that in context, for example. Sure, I'll I'll do my best to run through them. Um, I'll do the physical facility improvements. So our fire alarms, fire sprinklers, uh, the majority of that number there is fire sprinklers. Uh, certainly, that's an important component. Um, fire alarms are typically people consider more about uh, life safety, getting people out, okay, and sprinklers are more about saving the structure. Uh, so we've been focusing on alarms, and, and uh, we have an agreement with the the. A fire marshal, and we're going to be up to date on our alarms. Um, sprinklers um, often are done in conjunction with other work. And so that's where I think you will see a lot of this is done. As we do other work, the sprinklers will be a component of that versus uh, an independent uh, project. Um, asbestos, we actually have a lot of great data on our uh, asbestos assessments. We have prioritizations of um, categories of workforce asbestos. Um, so, we, so we've taken care of much of the high we have, level absolutely, exposures. We have, yeah, uh, and we can get some detail too of what we would what we look to target next. And, and asbestos over time will deteriorate. So uh, you know, certainly some of these scopes of work like that one, even though it shows zero there with the, you know, the bold blue numbers, I think we would want to allocate some funds to go after what what those kind of higher priorities are. Asbestos also is often very much done with other work. When you do mechanical work, there is a lot of asbestos that's involved in the mechanical work. Does that get wrapped up in that mechanical number, or is that we would throw in a bit of extra money to take care of the asbestos? Because That is a there. great question. Tip, It's a little bit of column A and column B. Typically, when we have... Uh, funds that are allocated for a scope of work, whatever the impetus for doing that work is where we fund it from. So if it's a roof and it has asbestos work, typically the roof funds will take care of everything because there could be four or five other different categories. It's just a simpler way for us to account for it. Uh, there are exceptions when we go to do something fairly small like a flooring project and 90% of the cost is asbestos. And so sometimes we'll augment that way. Uh, our electrical systems and plumbing, so these are um, our systems that were, uh, these numbers were assessed in the FCA. Uh, both are very poor performing systems. We expect that we will have some critical need there over the course of the bond. Um, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of our, again, our other improvements, if we go and we do a mechanical system, there's a good chance that we're going to be replacing that electrical system or doing a, a significant upgrade to it because it just can't handle the new system. I would advocate for high efficiency, everything, Absolutely. and low flow water toilets. We'll get you some good data on what our standards are um, for when we go and do this type of work. Code, yeah. yeah. You could also go. Yeah, code. I'll get. We'll get you some good. Uh, um, so when we first started computerizing stuff back in the '96 bond, '95 bond, whatever that year was. Um, we did a bunch of electrical work because we didn't. The circuits were built for a coffee maker. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, are there risks involved as we, if we made this investment and everything that Don ever wanted, um, are, is there risk involved in that uh, the electrical system in our schools would be prone to blowing out fuses and or fire risk? Well, any project, whether, and I know Don has infrastructure uh, costs, I'm not sure if, if he's factored this in, but um, we will go and we will look at what the electrical capacity is. And therefore, if we need to upgrade the electrical capacity, we will do that. Then it will just become an ancillary but critical part of the project, a required part. Now that's That could be quite a bill. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So that's part of the other non-committed piece that's part mm -hmm. of the options. I have a question here about Smith. It looks like this contemplates total replacement. Um, $56 million? 
It does. Um, Last I'm time trying. we checked in with that little building, um, it seemed like the main part of the building was needed some maintenance. But we get rid of the, the rotten side of the building, and then uh, we still have a potentially functioning school with just a little bit of love and investment. Right? But here we see $56 million. I'm going to turn and see if Patrick can refresh my memory on that estimate. So I'm going to have to refresh my memory. <laughs> and just get back to us. But last time we yeah. talked about Smith, uh, the prevailing wisdom was that it didn't need a complete replacement. That we need to get rid of the decrepit part of it and then fix the rest of it. So – we hired a firm to look at Smith and uh, the options um, they looked at um, to bring that to bring Smith up to a fully operational school. I think they had two options they looked at. Um, I believe, if memory serves, and we'll confirm this, I'll, we'll get you the correct information if I'm incorrect. This 56 million is to bring it up to a fully functional school with three sections with an addition a gym addition, um, and so we're redoing the main building, full renovation of the main building, building an additional gym wing, a media center. I mean, there's... So bring it up to the educational suitability. Yes. Yeah. That's so it's... <clears throat> but we'll, we'll confirm that. For, for the public record, we got a letter from somebody who wanted to be here to testify and couldn't, and I'll just... Uh, the, the tag from from Dean Smith. <laughs> uh, the tagline being, in short, I believe that in the case of Smith School, it can't wait till 28. So I just want to acknowledge that as, as a public comment. Yeah. Do we do, do we have? And again, um, love to see a little. Where are we on enrollment projections? Um, well, we know we have overcrowding at Maplewood. Right. Right, but again, a couple of those adjacent. We we need this before the bond. I mean, before we make a bond decision, we need. I'd I'd like to see a a one pager or something. Right, fifty-six million dollars is a lot of money to put into a. Yeah. Um, And you know if. Yeah. So can we? we Do we do we really need this? Are there other ways to deal with that? But but sure, we need we need to get. Us and Mr. Smith and others, a good answer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. So I have sort of a, a question along the same line, um, but it's about the middle school surprise. Um, so the question about Beaumont, when we had looked at moving Vernon, so it wasn't a K-8, into Beaumont, there was some question about the facility not being able to, because of the class, the condition of the classroom. So the question, my question on Beaumont is, um, what's that increment that it could take the expanded um, Vernon uh, six eight? Just if you're looking at, that's one of the ones that is still sitting out there, and then um, the. Middle school conversion or, and Harrison Park, what's that cost? Because um, I don't think they can. we can wait eight years um, to get them back into a similar for, blind formation. And then my last sort of middle school piece would be Tubman. And I don't see if the freeway gets expanded, which it seems like it's going to be that we – um, can keep that school there. So, what it would the cost to move it and build it, or some other variation, but mm-hmm. not having those students sitting on mm-hmm. even closer to the lip of a mm-hmm. major freeway. Yeah, I think what we can do, and uh, kind of first bigger picture answer about capacity is uh, from the capacity team, they have have stated that, and this was late last year, and I don't think it's changed. Uh, there isn't any sort of specific capital need identified now for enrollment or capacity needs. Now, as we go through this enrollment process, that could ch- could very likely change. Uh, we just don't know what that scope is now, so we, we can't 
really estimate what that is now. And most of these TBDs are on here are because it's the scope is unclear. What exactly would that mm -hmm. be? Um, That's why you but, can't see it. But I guess when are we when are we going to get more clarity? Because so for example, those would be among my highest priorities. Mm -hmm. And they may not be much. It may be you need a new science lab in Harrison Park and some classroom reconfigurations to have it be a more of a middle school mm -hmm. format. But it seems like we need to we need to know that because otherwise, if we have an eight year bond, it's not going to happen for a decade. If if it's if we unless have we have out. funds available for capacity changes. Um, well, I wouldn't want to. Just speaking for myself, put my priority items into well, if we have available funds. Mm -hmm. So, like, if if I was going to be prioritizing, to me that would be one of my higher priorities. So it seems like it'd be worth knowing what that is because they're it's especially out in the well, out of southeast. It's um, you're still going to have the last cluster of sure. K eights. And I'll, I'll, I'll confer with the capacity team. I'm, I'm not up to speed. And my general understanding, I could be wrong, is those decisions won't be made or known before the bond. So we pretty much made a commitment about Harrison Park as okay. a follow-on to Kellogg. So there's one. Can you remind me about that commitment? Well, just that in our enrollment balancing discussions um, and the work that we're doing, we have put forward a charge to say we want to look at, we want to figure out the feeder patterns for Kellogg and at the same time the feeder patterns for constituting Harrison Park as a, as a middle school. So even though we wouldn't implement in the same year, what we've discussed is implementing a year later, um, that should be part of the same exercise since it's the same Geography. It's the last cluster of the under-enrolled K-8s that haven't been converted back. Mm -hmm. And they're concentrated well, in the outer southeast. Yeah, this is what I heard the word commitment. I just was curious whether that was a formal thing through resolution or an informal statement from the board. Um, sim similar, there's a lot of commitments, uh, for instance, to do the next three high schools. I'm just curious in terms of where it ranks in terms I, of commitments. I guess what I'm referring to is that we have made it part of the charge for enrollment balancing. Two weeks ago, um, and the, the to, to 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 redo the school or to look at the feeder <coughs> pattern to issues. To create another middle, the second middle, well, uh -huh. middle school. So, in, uh, to make it a middle school implies some degree of facilities improvements, which we've seen before. It could be very minimal, like just adding sinks to make science classrooms that are appropriate for, you know, middle grades experience, experiments or could be more. Just, under $25 million expenditure. Sure. It's not like a... Oh, no, but there's lots. Of, I, 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 just, I guess I just want to be clear. Yeah, yeah. When, what, 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 what we talked about two weeks ago was not to put something in the bond. What we talked about was looking right. at how we adjust it going right. forward. And I guess so what, there are lots of options to do that, some of which may be putting money in the bond, some of which may not be. Which is a, t a totally valid point. I guess I just want to have the number because you can't really have even the discussion about whether it's part of a package if you don't know what the number is. And it seems like if you're not a line item, um, you might just not there might not be funds can, can you remind me, um, were there capacity in increases in either the 2012 or 2017 bond? Um, I mean, other than Kellogg <coughs> being reconstituted, uh -huh. uh, there was not. And the, some of the high schools got larger, but there weren't, I guess only Kellogg would be the specific additional capacity project. So 2012 didn't have any capacity projects, and, and I guess Kellogg maybe could be considered that for 2017. Correct. But okay. I think there's an, it's, it's an interesting policy question for the board in terms of whether we should be focusing the bonds on existing infrastructure backlogs, mm -hmm. of which we've got billions, or whether we should be focusing them on new capacity, um, or whether we should be doing both. And it sounds like in the past, boards have not focused on new capacity in terms of the bond programs. Well, this no, isn't no. new it's capacity. It's not just, the op just the opposite. The 2012 bond in my view, was constructed to do minimal, like what are the least number of roofs we can do without a disaster? Um, you know, what's kind of the minimal pieces that we can do? 
There was some science classroom improvements. It did have science classroom improvements, didn't it? And it had some ADA. ADA It had educational improvements and certainly physical facility and obviously the high school modernizations, which some of those high schools got larger. So within the modernization is everything, I guess. But the 2012 didn't have any specific we're doing this project for to alleviate capacity issues or for increased capacity. So I guess I don't view this as an increased capacity issue. I view it as a couple regions of the city went to these K-8 models with the promise that they would be like funded, fully funded or fully enrolled. They didn't get fully enrolled and were in the process of moving everybody back because the program is hard to sustain a robust academic program with a very few numbers in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. So these aren't capacity. These are educational improvements. So Roseway Heights, we went in and we did a bunch of IT improvements and some other stuff. Like made it appropriate for a middle school. So it's what the other middle schools would have. So, for example, when we did Tubman, there's a nice new science lab that is a middle school science lab versus the Fabian had been there before. So it's, if you think, if you take like, let's take Jackson, like they never went to the K-8 model and so they wouldn't have to go back because they've always been a middle school. So this is like you're taking buildings that are, haven't had middle school students in them and taking kids who are getting a diminished or less robust academic program and putting them in the appropriate setting. So it just never, it never happened. In a lot of neighborhoods, they just never went to that model. So it's not really, so this is like a go back almost is the best way to describe it. But it also aligns those building facilities for middle schoolers aligns with our vision. And the problem with Kellogg is they probably would have just reopened Kellogg if it hadn't so deteriorated. So that would be not new to capacity. It would just been you to reopen the middle school that was there in the neighborhood, but it was had so deteriorated when it was closed for a period of time that to get a middle school, you just had to create a new structure because one didn't ex- one didn't exist that was functional for yeah I guess maybe the difference school. maybe it maybe it's the capacity is the wrong word I, I guess maybe the difference is that we're making we're potentially talking about changes here to meet educational not specifications but whatever we call them um, but not because those facilities are necessarily the worst facilities in the district so th- there's a difference here when we look at the right. physical facility improvements right or even the educational improvements were what the staff have done a really good job of is sort of going back and saying, here, here is this huge backlog, massive, which we won't take care of in 2020 bond, um, and here's how we begin to prioritize that. There is a difference between sort of looking at the worst of the worst versus looking at um, changing these to make them, to adapting them to, to be more suitable for middle school students. I mean, it is, it's a different well, nature actually, of Actually, it's not really. It's a total equity issue. Um, these students were put in a diminished Educational, not not intentionally. I mean, we didn't know that at the time when they got converted over, the board, the superintendent of staff, wasn't anticipating they'd be under-enrolled and you would have a very much less robust program. If you have 150 kids, you have a very different program, middle middle grades program, than if you have 700 program, 700 students. Um, and because of how it happened, it mostly happened in lower income neighborhoods, um, often with majority um, students of color in those in those schools. And so this isn't, it's a totally, di- to me it's like not even a comparable issue. Like what, it's not really a facilities issue, it's a like, oh yeah, that's what's what the I'm right saying. programming I'm saying issue. it's a very different thing. But from a board perspective, if it's still a zero-sum game, we have to invest in one or the other. So it is challenging, right? But as a board, we need to figure out, do we, do we make those investments in that, whether we call them capacity or whatever the word is, or do we make investments in our physical physical facility um, 
improvements and in, in throughout the district so so they are hard to compare and yet we will have to figure out a, a methodology for right. doing so but so that's why I'm wanting the numbers and I don't think it's that it's actually not that big of a number compared to a lot of these other numbers I don't think but well they're in line with several of our blue line items here because what they are is um, uh, it's an item that doesn't meet our educational suitability criteria. So if you're if if you are supposed to be a middle school, you're supposed to have these spaces here. And if they don't, it's just like any other one of these items saying, you know, from an educational suitability perspective, you came up short on this. So it's not it's not a it's not a a different entity altogether. It's just a different line item. It could it could be so I think last year we spent like visual and performing arts or something four million dollars mm -hmm. just trying to make small added improvements to the academic program to try and get some equity and part of the conversation was about um, actually um, it, it, at a certain point it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense because you're adding more staff into a very small base but so Actually, the mo the, what makes more economic sense is have a larger um, student body and then the, there's more efficiency in the academic programming that's offered. So just another way to look at it. You can so you may have an op operational savings. Right, because yeah. you, you... Great. Um, another question for staff. Is it accurate to say that this, this sort of the data, um, all facility condition assessment, educational improvement data that you've put forward, the physical facility improvements, was that data not available in 2017 when we were putting that bond forward? Has that, have we grown a lot in terms of sophistication around that data, or was that data available back then? The, the data we have now is certainly considerably better. We just finished an FCA, of course, here yeah. not even two months ago. Um, but certainly we had some data. So I think the magnitude of a lot of it was... Um, known. I just don't know if we have the level of specificity we have yeah. now. With that. I was going to say, was, we didn't have the yeah. And I guess, and maybe this is not a, a question for you, maybe it's maybe I should call up some former board members. I'm curious, though, whether there was a discussion in 2017 around all of these infrastructure needs that we've gone through in, in a lot of really good detail today, um, whether that same trade-off came up. Do we do a high school or do we do some of these back? Because, again, the, the, the data helps inform the issue, but the issues were still there three years ago. Right. I mean, in the same magnitude, pretty much. I would say from my experience, there was very little conversation about that because um, it was upstaged by the emergent needs around health and safety. So, the um, you know, we were not discussing for the most part. I mean, we talked about roofs and what was going to fail mm -hmm. imminently, um, but we weren't talking about mechanical systems, really, because we had these very emergent needs Around and, health and safety. And, and around that, because I know the, that was the, the lead sort of issues, but was there a discussion at that point about only doing one or two high schools in order to do more health and safety work? Yeah, so there was, um, at least I'll, I'll speak, so Amy was the only person who was on the uh, board during the last referral. I was on the on stakeholder advisory group, and there, I mean, there was a, you know, how big do we build the high schools? Because um, uh, there was a, a fairly extended discussion about Benson and building it for 1,700 because the data, there, there wasn't an enrollment plan um, to get it to 1,700. There's a question about Kellogg. Um, the big question was how big of the health and safety package could you actually um, plan and, and deploy and get bids on and actually get done. And I think John, um, Courtney Welton and um, Dr. John Burnham. Spent, mm -hmm. Dr. Burnham, thank you, uh, spent a fair amount of time uh, putting that together. And there was one of the packages, I think, was two, $220 million, um, in health and safety. But the sense was that even if we, because there, there, there was a lot of support for doing that higher number, but the sense is that you, you couldn't, actually spend that much money. Yeah. So no, they no, went for that. 150. Sure. And then I just to add to think I think the the incoming board, the 2017-2018 board, um, it was absolutely a priority to reopen Harriet Tubman and Roseway Heights and there had there wasn't any money in it for 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 that and if we were going to 
be doing, I mean, we ended up funding it a different way, but. Um, well, yeah, and, and it was, what, six months later when we actually, we just said we're going to do it and figure out where the money was going to come from and what came yeah. out of the construction excise tax eventually what we landed on, right, for the funding source. So th it's actually, and maybe it's a good segue, and I know we're way over time, uh, and I, I want to actually allow Chair Constant to continue to chair the meeting because she's done such a good job. Um, but did we want to go through staff recommendations quickly? Uh, I, I, Dan? And, and I guess, and the reason why I think there was a good segue there is because I, I think there is a, a really interesting question about when we look at options sort of A, B, and C, um, you know, we look at, at, you know, option, let's take B, for instance, you know, $229 million of educational investments and, and almost $400 million of physical facility improvements. Have we looked at that capacity issue that if, in fact, we went forward with that type of a package, would we as a district have the capacity to do those massive amounts of, of improvements in sort of the next, in an eight-year period of time? It's a great question. Um, we did look at all of the the options when you and when you read through the, the one packet, we mm -hmm. we try to be clear on what we think is achievable, and on on all the options and on every individual scope of work, uh, we note that we think that is achievable. That said, when you start to put it all together, it becomes something of another challenge. Not even as much as completing it from. Uh, design and construction standpoint, but the impacts to the schools. When you think about the number of schools, they're going to get a number of very, very large improvements. There, I, I wouldn't say none of it could be done. Option A, I think, would be a very, very significant challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, the improvements do not have to be done in eight years. They, they could go a little bit longer. Uh, and again, scopes could change a little bit that that could make that a little bit easier. Um, so I think option A would be a big challenge. I wouldn't say it's not doable. I think option B would also be uh, a challenge, but I would say doable. Um, and then option C and D are certainly achievable. So in terms of next steps, um, I guess there was a little bit, there was, um, you did not go over the community engagement plan tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that would be useful for next Tuesday's board meeting, um, board work session, mm -hmm. um, because I think it'd be good for the entire board to hear that and weigh in on that. Um, and I guess the question, maybe putting this back to staff. So when we had sort of a conversation, um, the goal coming out of next Tuesday's, so the goal of this was to begin this conversation with mm -hmm. the committee and all interested parties. Um, we'll have the full board next Tuesday um, to go over some of this material again, um, but really to begin to talk about what do we want to be sharing with the community. Do, do we want to be going out with four options? Do we want to be going out with two mm -hmm. options uh, or three? Um, somewhere in between. That's sort of the end goal for next Tuesday. It is. The, um, the thought for the exercise tonight was to do the exercise and ask everyone to report out their number one and number two options after they, they made some adjustments. And if all things align, everyone had the same number one, number two, well, that made things a lot easier for the goal of it on Tuesday. Uh, I think we really want to ask the board to say, okay, what are the two? Mm -hmm. And so um, this would be more of an informal, what's every individual's one and two, and then, but next week really trying to say, Okay, board, can you come up with your number one and your number two? And you did not do that exercise before I got here. Am I right? That is correct. Okay. So I had a question about the engagement. We kind of wanted um, to understand what number one and two and three and four were before we okay. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely, we, we do. I, um, about the engagement piece, we have a lot of letters from people, and so that would be considered a stakeholder group, the people that are writing in. Do you get those emails too? You know, I, do you I, get the I definitely get some. I don't do know you if want I to get start them getting all. them all. <laughs> yeah, we can. We're happy to forward. Sure. Um, but I mean, I think that that's that's a group of stakeholders that we um, that we that we hear from um, that have a voice in the process. And sure. I just wasn't sure how we were collecting that, responding to that information, or if it was even known it was happening. Sure. If, if we want, we can bring up the team to talk about the engagement, or we can wait till Tuesday. I think Tuesday's fine. I'm, okay. I don't want to hold anybody. I think at this point we're going to need to cover that pretty thoroughly with the entire board, so okay. um, I think we can wait till Tuesday. It's on a that. concern. Um, I think 
one question that I would like to have answered on. It's really answered. It's just not codified. Um, on Tuesday is like another category of just staff assessment of what work is essential because like in the technology presentation, I mean, you're talking about system failure. You're talking about inability to perform foundational functions for this school district if we don't invest in some of these things. And so I, I kind of, in my mind would like to see another category of staff sense of this is not optional. I think that would be really valuable. I think that's valuable not just from a bond perspective, from a budget perspective as well. Because I think knowing sort of those things and sort of using that, you know, to the extent something's critical, yes, it can go in the bond, but the bond is also uncertain. To the extent it's critical, we need to be figuring out from a right. budget perspective how to be mm -hmm. investing in this in this maintenance, you know, moving forward. So. So it's a twofer in terms of educating your board. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think the question, and I don't know if this is the look you're giving me, is is where that line is, right, in terms of, of, of you know, what's really critical or not. So Right, and I would submit in the materials there is – it's not a super clean answer. Um, there's there's a lot of variables. It's not so gonna be. I mean, the, right. So I think the materials try to call out of this is what staff believes is critical, and if we had our druthers, here's option A, and that right. that's what we get. But understanding there's lots of variables, there's lots of dependent components here. Here's what the step downs might do, and here's the additional risk for that. We could so, easily pull that out of these materials right now. You know, on the technology side, on the mechanical side, mm -hmm. I mean, curriculum is a little more subjective, you know, in terms sure. of what do you consider, mm -hmm. like, can we go on underserving our students with outdated materials? Mm -hmm. Yes, they'll be safe, but is that the kind of education that we want to provide? Right. So. Great. Anything else from a staff perspective that you wanted to cover tonight? I don't think so. Uh, maybe just a quick question on Tuesday. Do we think it would be beneficial to largely go through this again than do the exercise? Um, no, I'm, not, I'm sorry. When I say this again, I don't mean <laughs> the the having everyone come up and, and talk about the detail, but going through having these materials and going through the exercise. So I think the materials, yes. I think we should encourage board members you know, who, who aren't on the committee to, again, familiarize themselves as much as they can. I think the exercise is probably where we need to go, but okay. but framing it with this idea of, of the, the goal is to come out of here with two options that we're yep. going to take out to the public. Yep. And yeah, is that great. from a community engagement perspective, is, is two the right number, or or could there be a third option? Does staff have a view on, I know there could be, and there could be six options, right? But does staff have a view on whether two or three is beneficial? I'll let anyone come up here and yell at me, but I, two is the number that we were talking about would probably be the best. Okay. Uh, that said, if there's compelling reasons to do others, then there's compelling reasons to do. I have very strong feelings about limiting the number of options because of just decision overload. Sure. And Absolutely. fatigue. I used to work in the interior design world, and if you present too many options, it's – it's better just to it's, yeah. it's so red we, or blue. We or can yes. present A or B. Present to and how would you tweak these or you know where is your central tendency? I, I'd like this one better than that one, but I'd like to tweak there. It's like the yeah, eye maybe. doctor. This one or this one? <laughs> yeah. Right? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think yeah. I just think it's better to have two you know well you know not well baked but t two you know. Cl Clear options for people to vote on, and um, people can provide feedback on either. Um, because having too many decisions never works out well. Yeah. So I, I think diving into the t talking a little bit about what we're talking about with you know the community engagement, diving into the exercise, we can try and bring um, Director Lowry up to speed. So. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah I want to appreciate the non-committee yeah. board members, not a non-official committee board members who are here to that. That'll help us. Here or or on the line. Director Moore on yeah. the phone. Yeah. Any other questions from board members before we adjourn? Thank you for staying Rita? late. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Um, no, I I think people have covered it. Um, I, I I just want to second the um, the request for the um, we uh, not optional list and. And when we go out and do community engagement, I think it's important to inform people about 
the potential consequences of not doing some of this work because they won't otherwise know. So that's all. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody.